This is the electromagnetic spectrum. First of all, what is electromagnetic waves? Well, these are particles of energy that don't have any mass. And visible light is what we know best. Visible light, the range from red to purple, is just varying in frequency. And that's what we have down here. Now, at higher frequencies, we have X-rays and gamma rays and cosmic rays. and this is what's known as ionizing radiation because there's enough energy in that radiation to directly damage DNA. Then below visible light, we have infrared radiation. That's life on Earth would not be possible without the heat from the sun. That's infrared radiation. And below that, we have the communication frequencies. Uh, and basically, most of those are, are what would be called microwaves. Now, People have been skeptical that there could be any adverse health effect at lower frequencies because obviously life on Earth was dependent on both visible light and infrared radiation. But when you put a potato in your microwave oven, it obviously cooks the potato. So it's not a totally benign thing. And uh, what I'm going to talk about, and I think other speakers tonight will talk about, is the magnitude of the evidence that there are adverse health effects of the, these forms of radio frequency radiation below that of visible light at intensities that don't just cook your brain or cook your potato. The International Agency for Research on Cancer is part of the World Health Organization. It's based in Lyon, France. And these are the ultimate re uh, authorities on what things cause cancer. And in 2011, they rated radio frequency radiation as a possible human carcinogen. And that evidence was based primarily in the fact that people would talk on their cell phone for long periods of time and don't pay attention to the, the recommendations to keep it away from your head, uh, but hold it right up against their head, which most of us do because no one knows about that fine print. Uh, if you talk on your cell phone for 10 years or more, multiple hours a day, your risk of developing brain cancer is sky high. And it's the worst kind of brain cancer, the glioblastoma. That's the kind Ted Kennedy had, John McCain had, Bo Biden had, uh, and all people that spent a lot of time in their cell phones. You can never say in one particular case that it was causative, but it's certainly suggestive. Now, the reason it wasn't a stronger recommendation at this time was that nobody had ever de demonstrated that animals developed cancer from cell phone frequency radiations. That changed a year ago when the US National Toxicology Program exposed rats for the duration of their lifetime to cell phone frequency radiations, and they developed the same two cancers that we see in people. Radio frequency radiation at intense level causes cancer. Now, well, everyone thinks our government's going to protect us from any things that are dangerous. Well, think again. In the US, the Federal Communications Commission is the organization responsible for setting standards for our cell phones, for our Wi-Fi, and things like that. Uh, and they say, well, you know, we don't really have standards. We have recommendations. And uh, if you're really concerned about it, there's some things you can do. Use a speaker phone. Use don't use your cell phone, use a, a landline, a whole variety of things you can do, but they have standards that are grossly out of date. Now, the Government Accounting Office has begun to look over the shoulder of the Federal Communications Commission, and they are saying, you know, you haven't really given very much in the way of advice or standards. Now, I went with a colleague to the FCC a couple of years ago trying to understand why they have such ludicrously inaccurate standards. Basically, the FCC says if your brain doesn't heat when you talk on a cell phone, or if your body doesn't heat when you're in a Wi-Fi environment, there's no problem. Well, that is just, it totally ignores an enormous body of evidence from scientists around the world that show there are multiple adverse health effects 
Cancer is a big one. Uh, men that hold a wireless laptop on their lap too long will have reduced sperm counts. That usually gets the men's attention. Uh, there are women that put their cell phone in their bra have an elevated risk of breast cancer. And now we're beginning to understand that there's a whole syndrome called electrohypersensitivity where some people are unusually sensitive to exposure to radio frequency radiation and even electricity related magnetic fields and develop a syndrome that consists of fatigue and headache and a feeling their brain isn't working right and pain of various sorts. Uh, but the FCC hasn't really dealt with this. Now here's the guidelines in the US, Australia, Canada relative to some other countries in the world. Now actually I'm a little suspicious about some of these guidelines because it's pretty well known that even though some of these countries have official guidelines, they don't enforce them very well. But you can see how outrageously out of sync the US is with other countries in terms of recommendations in terms of exposure. And that very high level of radiation limits is all set to prevent your brain from being heated when you talk on your cell phone or when you're exposed to any other form of uh, radio frequency radiation. It's short-term exposure, but think about our lives. We are exposed to this radiation continuously. If your cell phone is on, it's, it's communicating with the cell tower. If you talk on it, it's going to communicate much more. So the FCC has these limits, and we know those are wrong. Now, where did those limits come from? Well, they came from the engineering community and the physics community, not the health community. When Cindy Sage and I went to the FCC, they said, well, we don't have any health expertise. We get all of our advice from EPA and NIH and other health agencies. Well, those health agencies have no advice at all to give. EPA discontinued all of their research functions on electromagnetic fields. NIEHS hasn't had any activity on this issue for years. So the question that short-term exposure can cause thermal damage, yes. But even there, many cell phones exceed the guidelines, especially when people hold them to their ears. So we've got real problems in that uh, many people unknowingly, they don't know this, this issue, and yet they're, they're exposed at, at dangerous levels of radio frequency radiation. My colleague Dominic Belpom in Paris has done some wonderful studies. We have all this evidence that people get cancer from electromagnetic fields, but until you show that animals get cancer, they didn't believe it. It's the reverse situation from studies of chemicals, where we usually know that we study chemicals in animals first, and then we, we begin to look in people. But here we've got enormous amount of evidence that people develop cancer, develop these other diseases from this exposure, but they didn't want to believe it until we showed that, the, that you have cancer in animals. We have that evidence now. One other issue has been that there weren't clinical chemistry tests. You couldn't take a blood sample or urine sample and identify people that suffered from this syndrome of electrohypersensitivity. Uh, electrohypersensitivity, these are relatively nonspecific symptoms. We all get headaches every now and then. We all feel like our brain doesn't work right <coughs> quite often. Uh, we all get tired. Uh, but when people find that if they go into the presence of high levels electromagnetic fields, those symptoms appear in spades. And many people are totally disabled because of their having to be in an environment where they're exposed. Dr. Belpom and his colleagues have now found a whole series of tests in blood and urine. They distinguish people that have electrohypersensitivity from people that do not. We are beginning now to find rigorous clinical tests that will distinguish electrohypersensitivity <laughs> subjects from other people. It's a real disease, and it can be very disabling. This is the Job Accommodation Network. 
And one of the big issues here is how do we protect people that have this illness? People that can't continue on the job they used to have because the environment is full of radio frequency fields that cause them to be ill. Or particularly in the, in the reason we're talking here tonight, students that are electrosensitive that have to go to school, but the school has so much radio frequency radiation that the students get ill. You think about schools today. Most schools have Wi-Fi throughout the school. Think about the computer classroom. Now, it's very important that everybody have access to the net, the internet, that they learn to use it. It's a, it's a, it's a critical part of our society. But if you have 20 or 30 kids in a wireless computer classroom with one big router up there, those kids are basically in a mini microwave oven because all of the laptops are communica communicating. And is it any wonder that some of the kids become ill? I say no. So this job accommodation network suggests some things that can be done to help accommodate people that suffer from electrohypersensitivity. Uh, and if, if you think it's bad now, uh, let me just warn you that the rate we're going is going to get worse. There's implementation of 5G, the next generation uh, wireless communication, which is going to result in many cell towers put in front of every fifth or sixth house. You're not going to be able to walk down the sidewalk without being continuously exposed. You're not going to be live, able to live in your home without being continuously exposed at levels much greater than we have now. But uh, provide handset extenders or alternate headsets. Change the employee's shift to allow them to work at times when everybody else has gone home with their cell phones. Re Relocate workplaces away from areas where symptoms are triggered. Little simple things that can be done that can make an enormous difference. One of the things that Dr. Belpom has shown is that many of the people that are sensitive to electric, electromagnetic fields are also sensitive to chemicals. And there are many people that have that syndrome that also have chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. I've had a major study of Gulf War illness where veterans from the 1990 Gulf War uh, developed the same set of symptoms, probably because of some environmental exposure. We don't know exactly what it is. There must be something in common with all of these things. And Dr. Belpom's work has shown that some of these same clinical blood and urine assays are found in individuals with uh, multiple chemical sensitivity. This is just a, one example of a situation in school. This is where the wireless equipment is close to where students are. So, of course, the students are going to be highly exposed. Now, not everyone is going to respond with the same sim symptoms. There's a variety of susceptibilities. There are probably a lot of people that have symptoms that don't recognize what they come from. But in schools, it's pretty clear when a child gets a headache every time he goes to school and recovers when they go home. Access points in school classrooms and dorms uh, that are against Federal Communication Commission guidelines are common. And, and these are just examples in one school of that. Now, these are measurements taken in a meter that detects radio frequency radiation. The top is from a school that has limited use of, de of devices, and the bottom is from a school that has extensive use. Each of those peaks is a peak of radio frequency radiation. And you know, one of the issues is the FCC standards will average those over long periods of time. We have increasing evidence that it isn't just the average overall that's important. It's the rapid on and off. And you see how many of those massive peaks there are there. Here are just some other examples of school readings uh, versus the coffee shop readings. Now, coffee shops often have Wi-Fi. You can't go into a McDonald's or a Starbucks without being in a Wi-Fi environment. And some very electrosensitive people get sick when they do that. But you can see how some schools, because of this idea that you have to make everybody accessible to uh, the internet 
by their laptop, by their pad, by their cell phone, and that's the result in terms of exposure. The Bioinitiative Report is an encyclopedic listing of health effects. It's more than you ever wanted to know. You can find it at www.bioinitiative.org. I was the co-editor-in-chief for this report. Uh, it's, as I say, it's encyclopedic. It takes, takes each of the health effects, each of the organ systems, and provides information. Uh, the, the point is just to provide this as a frame of reference, not to go into the great details, because uh, our, our focus tonight is the situation in schools, and particularly on the syndrome of electrohypersensitivity. As I've said, we're only now beginning to really rigorously diagnose it. Clinicians can certainly diagnose nonspecific symptoms, but how do you rigorously tie those symptoms to an exposure? Traditionally, when we talk about chemicals that cause cancer and symptoms, we take a blood test. We measure the chemical in the body. It's a relatively straightforward thing. It's not so simple here. That's why development of laboratory tests is very important. In the Bioinitiative Report, we tried to publish some guidelines for what would be safe. Now, this is where you really end up with some problems. For example, it's pretty well accepted by everybody in the field of cancer that if something causes cancer, there is no level of exposure that does not cause cancer. In other words, there's a linear dose response curve. Now, there may be an exposure that's so low that you can't actually measure the increase of cancer, but there's no threshold below which there's no risk. Obviously, uh, there are electromagnetic fields in nature. Life evolved with some. What we've done in the last few years is dramatically increase our exposure enormously. We didn't have Wi-Fi or cell phones 40 years ago. Uh, cell phones were actually invented in the U.S., but they were first marketed in Scandinavia. Uh, so, you know, we're doing an experiment on the human population. And now we're expanding around the world with 5G and putting these cell towers everywhere. Almost every school has Wi-Fi. Almost every school administrator is oblivious to the fact or don't want to hear that they may be putting their children at risk. I think that we have uh, great problems with our elected representatives. Most of them are unaware of the issue. Or if they're aware of it at all, they're aware that the, the telecommunications companies are giving them a lot of money to increase the, the out growth of, of 5G and other forms of exposure. Uh, the, the concerned citizens are usually not ones that can, can subsidize uh, elected representatives. So the, the solution is to have the public informed, because our politicians respond when people bang on their door and say, I demand that you protect our health. That's why we're here tonight, to try to let all of you know that this is an issue that's important to you, it's important to your family, and that we need to do something about it. It's very difficult to put genies back in the bottle. Uh, and I'm, you know, we're not going to go back to a pre-wireless age. But there's so many obvious things we can do that would reduce our exposure and increase our health, and we need to find how to go about and do that. Thank you very much. Thank you.